Welcome to a new perspective. Public comment, comments relating to agenda items. For this meeting will be heard during consideration of the item later in the meeting. We'll move to item D, one, school board and superintendent legislative update required training, Dr. Ely. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer, members of the board. Um, what we have today for you is um, our state required legislative update train. But before I get into that uh, preamble, let me address uh, the signatures going around. Um, Mr. Connolly is, Dr. Connolly is here uh, from Region 6 to provide our training uh, as board members. Uh, we have three board members on this board who were not here when you printed that out. So, oh. um, so find the person. Wow. Mr. Horak, Stretch uh, it Mrs. McAdams, yes. and Mr. Ben, find the person that uh, whose place you ran in and replaced. That's scratch right. their name out and please uh, uh, print your name and then sign it so that we can make sure we get that right. So I didn't communicate happen. that no, accurately okay. with you. I apologize. That every now and then. We so, get it off the website yeah. sometimes. And, yes. Uh, so we've got. Sometimes it's most uh, of the times it's right. So. <laughs> it's, yeah. So anyway, well, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, please, please make sure you do that and obviously sign yeah, in for the other things as well. That's through. it's going to validate your training to the state. So uh, with that, this is state mandated training. Um, in, in talking with the, uh, the, the previous board, uh, we made the determination, you know, it was probably best to wait till we had our three new board members uh, join the group so we can talk about the legislative update uh, and moving forward. So uh, as you are aware, as we've talked about in, in workshop and in, in meeting uh, in the past, um, uh, uh, especially, you know, last Tuesday, uh, House Bill 3, Senate Bill 11, a number of other changes occurred during the legislative session, uh, and it was quite lengthy and quite comprehensive, the changes that are coming that impact school boards. So, um, what, uh, so I appreciate uh, Dr. Connolly being with us today. Uh, our plan is to spend, uh, he thinks, around an hour and 45 minutes uh, on this. Under two hours. Under two hours. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I think our plan is to, uh, Mr. Schaefer, is at some point uh, towards the middle, maybe take a little brief recess and go grab some food and come back, uh, if, that, if that works for everybody. So with that, I would like to introduce to you Dr. John Conley, who's been with Region 6 Service Center for how long now? This is my seventh year. Former yeah. uh, uh, superintendent at Belleville ISD and worked in another, a number of other places uh, around the state. So, Chuck uh, Conley is one of my former students right yeah. over here. Dr. Conley, thank you for being <laughs> with, here with us and uh, look forward to what you have to share with us. Well, it's good to be here. I was here, I guess, about a year ago, it seems like. Maybe I've been here. This is my second, third, maybe a third time to be here, and uh, I really enjoy coming. I, I really like these are comfortable chairs, by the way. I just want you to know that. Yeah, the last one I did, I stood up the whole time, and I don't mind doing that. I do that a lot, but it's always nice when you get to sit around like this. I think it's just a, a much more personal type of... Uh, of environment, so uh, that's good. Yeah, well, the first time uh, I did this, and probably for all of the people that at Region 6, we've got about three or four of us that do these trainings. It, I'm gonna say it probably took us two and a half hours the first time because it was hard to kind of go through and know exactly what we probably just didn't have to cover. There's some things in here that, you know, that really are not the types of things that you're gonna be interested in. Uh, and so we've kind of gotten that down. That's why I think now it, this thing has gotten down to where it's probably definitely under two, two hours. I say that, and so we'll see how that goes today. Depending uh, on questions. Yeah, well, that's true, too. So, and that's good. Comments and, and, uh, and discussion are always good. Um, here, I'll take that for you. Over here. All right, so what we're going to do, primarily the way this is going to work, uh, we've changed a little bit since we first started. You know, the document you have right here is the document that we're going to work off of. And it's, it's got everything in it that I'm going to cover. I'm not going to cover everything in this, though. So that I'll take you through page by page, tell you kind of what page we're on so you can follow and what, where we are. I've got a few slides to, to kick us off that will kind of help set the stage. And then we're just going to dive in to this document. We won't be looking at that anymore. We won't have, it won't be a PowerPoint at that point. So... Um, yeah, 86 legislative update. Um, that's what you're, of course, working out of right here. And there are some things, just to make you aware of, you may know some of this by now, you may not. That's the time frame, January 8th, 2019, May 27th is when they gaveled it uh, closed. Um, and what did they do during that time? Well, there were two, uh, a little over uh, 7,400 bills that were filed. 
uh, and again, uh, they do a lot. I'm not sure, you know, always what they do is what we need, but most of the time, uh, they do some good things too. Uh, for, over 1,400 of those bills were passed. So you can see how many did not make the cut. Um, 56 bills were vetoed. And then out of all of that, this is what we end up with is about 146 education bills. Now we're not gonna go over all 146, so you can take a deep breath on that. We're not gonna do that today. Uh, we're gonna try to hit the high points and some of the things that you may or may not know. Some of these things you're gonna know you will have dealt with and we won't spend much of any time on them. Other things you may not know at all. Uh, this is just FYI, if, if you know, some people like to go and see the final version of a bill and maybe dig into it. Uh, it's in your hand out there, but this is, you can go to that, that uh, website there, uh, www.capital.state.tx.us, and you can search different ways for that. If, you, if you're just really wanting to know, hey, I wonder what this bill really says, because we're just going to do a summary today. Uh, a real, real quick uh, lesson on how a bill becomes a law. I mean, very quick, but and, and you probably know this, uh, but it's good to help set the table a little bit here. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, you're going to get some similarities in bills oftentimes from the House and the Senate, although rarely are they the same, right? They're, you got two different uh, uh, bodies working on this. Uh, the one I can always point to is uh, teacher uh, salaries. Uh, how the information initially came out probably a couple of years ago. Uh, there was some talk about $10,000 raise for teachers, and we all were like, okay. Uh, and then by the time they, they started, they gaveled to start the session, it was 5000 Well, that's already been cut in half. And then, of course, by the time it was over, it was completely different than that. Now, 5000 still was in the mix somewhere. It depends on the district and depends on the type of funding that you got. But that's how they... And then so to get to that, there's committee action. Each committee, um, they're going to revise those bills. And only it says that, you know, the bills that are approved by the committee go to a full vote of the House or the Senate. Then there's some floor action that can take place after that where they debate those bills. And then conference action follows after that. If you've got two differing bills still, which often happens, they come to a conference committee, try to hammer out some agreement on those bills, and then they forwarded that. If they approve that, it comes to the floors uh, to be voted on by the, the both houses, and then that bill, if it's agreed upon, goes to the governor. A couple of ways the governor gets that in play. Of course, he signs it, which is the typical way that, that bills come uh, become uh, law, or he does not sign it, and it sits on his desk for, uh, they say, 10 to 20 days. I, I've forgotten why it's 10 or 20, but there's a difference there. And um, if he just chooses to let it sit, you can say, I didn't sign it, but it became law anyway. So uh, that, that's the way uh, uh, bills become laws. You've uh, already gotten your, at least your first heavy load of updates, uh, I, you know, and then of course that's sort of the, the path they take in terms of what ends up coming out in terms of TASB policy. Uh, the updates uh, are a result of TEA rulemaking that often obviously comes out of the session. They take the laws, they begin to break it down, sort it out, uh, digest it, and they come up with rules. And they're still, in fact, in the process of making rules. Um, and you know that probably will go on for a, a while longer. But that eventually, they, they pass that on, and TASB takes it. And, and what they try to do with policy, obviously, is determine legislative intent. Well, actually, TEA tries to determine legislative intent, and TASB then puts that into policy, which results in what you saw, I don't know. I, th I heard someone say it wasn't quite a thousand pages. It was 990 something pages, maybe. <laughs> but uh, and it probably won't be the last update you'll get. My guess is I'm sure there's going to be some others that follow. Now, most of that's local. I mean, most of that is legal. You don't have to approve that. So the the smaller portion, much smaller portion of that, is your local policy, which is what you've already probably done some approvals on. Um, just something uh, to know, uh, what it says what to do before a uh, policy adoption. Well, so the law you know, takes place once the governor signs it. But, you know, at that point, we're all in the dark. We really don't know. I mean, we can read what they passed, but we really don't know exactly how that's supposed to play out. Well, what's called harmony with the law mm -hmm. says a newly enacted law is applicable when effective. There's actually, you'll see one in here, I think that was effective June 14th, which probably is about the time it was signed. 
Uh, but it goes on to say, no policy or regulation or any portion thereof shall be operative if uh, it is found to be in conflict with applicable law. But it's applicable when it's effective, and that's a little bit of a tricky deal. I don't think you ever have anybody hold you to the fire on that. Really, I've never seen that. But at the bottom, you see it says the law supersedes policy. So you have policies that were current at that time. Laws have changed, which are going to change policies. But what? So the law supersedes whatever policy technically you have in your, your policy book at that time. It's a little bit of a, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a it takes a while for the system tricky to catch system, up. Tricky system, yeah, to catch up, and which is what we're trying to do now, and will be in the the, the months probably to come. Can, also, can I jump in real quick? No, so go a ahead, good yeah. example of that for us, for new board members, is we uh, we change in in August. We change our board operating procedures regarding public comment at our meetings yep. because that's a good one. Uh, update 114 hadn't been here and we didn't have new policy, but we knew that we had to make some changes on that. And you actually see it reflected on your agenda is that we have to provide uh, opportunity for comment on agenda items at every meeting that we have. Uh, and so um, while you have not uh, adopted uh, update 114, we have made that change because we were made aware of that. Yeah, and we'll we'll touch on that here in, in just a little while too. All right, so um, that that's what that is, uh, and then these are the the nine areas we're going to cover here uh, as, as uh, effectively and quickly as we can. Uh, so that's where we're going to leave it right there in terms of any of the PowerPoint type stuff. What we're going to do now is switch over to your document right here, and if you'll turn to page five, that's where we're going to start. So you get to skip the first four pages. That's already good. That's a good start already. Uh, and we'll skip a few more pages as we go through this thing. Financial matters. Again, we're, we're going to spend a, a limited amount of time on this, uh, and you'll see why as we go through. I do want to point uh, out a few things early on here. Changes to school finance. Under that school finance tab right there, you see the, that paragraph. Uh, if you're a Chapter 41, which <coughs> you are, right? Well, now it's Chapter 49. You're now 49, yes. You know that. If you were 42, you're now 48. So that's just, uh, you know, getting people used to changing those those numbers in terms of the chapters and how they're identified uh, in the Education Code. One of the other things, too, which is pretty obvious, is the commissioner was given a lot more latitude, it appears, uh, as a result of this legislative session. He has gotten... Not, I wouldn't say it's carte blanche, but he's gotten a lot of leeway to do uh, put things in place, which you see, of course, uh, a lot of things that are rolled out. I mean, a bunch of things. And it's really a little bit overwhelming uh, at sometimes the pace that they go at. But uh, it says he may take steps to resolve unintended consequences from the formulas in the bill until tw the year 2021 20, um, Every session that comes every two years, um, there always are unintended consequences from something that happens. They, I, I think they try to avoid those things, uh, but sometimes you can't know and there are unintended consequences. And sometimes it's related to money. So, I, you know, it kind of depends on, on the, the, the leeway they've given the commissioner here, but they've given him some leeway to maybe help correct a situation or some situations as he sees they arise that maybe are formula based, things like that that really impact districts in a way that it was not intended. Real quickly, um, as you go down this page here, you see special education, dyslexia, compensatory education allotment. If you turn to page six, uh, bilingual education allotment, uh, I'll come back to career and technology, early education allotments in there. And then we'll cover CCMR. But those I just mentioned, the main thing that you probably already know there, or you should know, is they just were given different weights and increased weights per student that, that, that qualify for those programs. So it's basically more money, uh, depending on the, on the population that you have in your district. Uh, career and technology, one of the big deals here was would be that always in the past, if you had career and technology, Obviously, at your high school, it was weighted that way. You got additional weighting for that. Uh, you didn't get it, though, if you had it in your middle schools or your junior highs. Uh, and, and a lot of districts offered some things that could qualify probably in those areas. You just didn't get, you just funded it locally. Well, now, starting with grade seven, all the way up through grade 12, 
they have weighted those those uh, programs that maybe districts either have been offering or maybe now they'll be encouraged to offer uh, in their career and technologies a CTE allotment. So that's a good thing there. Your uh, CCMR, your college career military readiness, uh, that's just about the bonus. Won't spend a lot of time on that except to say they're still, I think, trying to sort this one out a little bit. There's been some guidance on it. Um, one of the things that seemed to be of particular interest was that last bullet that uh, $2,000 uh, if the graduate is enrolled in a special education program, which you oftentimes you have some of your special ed students, maybe many of them, in CT CTE programs. Well, there's maybe some additional monies that are available for those students right there through that program. Before we get sure. too much further, can, can we go back to, and it's just a general question, yeah. probably for me more personally, on page five on the dyslexia sure. and related disorders. Is that something that's new? Is that well, the, it says it creates a, an allotment for each student. Um, y yes, it is new. It's uh, new because they've created it that way. Yeah, it's a new allotment. So it was a new allotment yeah. that was not there before. It was, it it was not there uh, before. That was really uh, Chairman Huberty from the House Public Education right. Committee was, it was very, very much a champion of that. And so, yes, that is new. We, we certainly have always been able in this district to serve students with dyslexia, either in the regular education program through Section 504 or through special education services. And we still have that. But now we have a little bit more of a funding component to help with those services. Okay. Yeah. And what's nice is, you, as he said, you get you can you can actually uh, collect both one if it's a dyslexia and or special education, you get both if you've got a student that qualifies in both areas. That's a good question, though, because one of the things that, that if you go to page seven, that's a little bit of a um, kind of parallels that, but in a different way is, is you're gifted and talented. Uh, first things they say here, the GT allotment is eliminated, which is true. If you're going your summary of finance, you're not going to find that there anymore. It's, it used to always be one of those areas that you saw a, a particular line item for GT. What they've done is they folded that into the formula, which then makes it hard to know exactly where did it go. It's just supposed to be there. And so you're still required, of course, to have, which I, you know, districts, I think, uh, know this, but you're still required to have an established GT program that meets certain requirements. But they just taken away the, and there was that was always a big deal over the years. Is uh, how much was allotted for GT programs and things like this, and the percentage of students. They basically have taken the cap off of that. You can identify as many GT kids now, pretty much as you want to. At one time, I can remember the debate was was it one percent, was it two percent, or as much as five percent. It kind of depended, and they had always had a hard time defining what that percentage was. So they've kind of removed those those uh, restrictions if you will so i just want to jump in uh, how you identify or the number of and percentage of kids who are gt that you identify uh by district is a local decision it's not exactly. determined by money what uh what, what dr Connolly was saying is uh the in the previous system we were capped to no more than five percent of mm -hmm. our kids being funded for gt for no more than five percent of our kids and college station isd we've well exceeded that number uh for a number of years and so we are <clears throat> you know, uh, taking local resources and local tax dollars to support our GT program and have in the past. And so what has happened uh, under House Bill 3 is uh, that allotment is no longer there. It got folded in that m big increase in the basic right. allotment. And rightly so, those who advocate at the state level for gifted and talented services wanted to make sure okay, districts don't just say, now I don't have to have a GT program. We have to certify that we're doing all the things mm -hmm. that we have been doing in the past. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that, that's been an, a, a, an evolutionary process because I can literally remember when it first started, the number was around 1% to 2%. And then there was always this debate. It finally got to 5%, and that now it's pretty much it's wide open. As you said, it's a local decision. Transportation allotment. That's uh, been a sort of a sore spot for, for districts uh, around the state since the 80s, I believe it's been, that they really, since they took any significant action, that's been changed to uh, the, the rate's now based on a dollar per mile per eligible student. And in most cases, that helps most districts. I did, I did this just recently in a district that was a smaller district, and it actually did not help them. Uh, so it kind of works both ways, but in, in the majority of cases, that does help a district in terms of transportation allotment. New instructional facility allotment, uh, it says it's been increased to 100 million in a school year. Uh, 
which makes me think this maybe this is 200 million over the biennium. It doesn't say that, but it says in a school year. So that's gone back and forth. About two years ago, they had cut that way back. Uh, prior to that, it had been around 200, 225 million, something like that. So they're kind of getting that number back up. Okay. So, so for those who are new yep. to the board, new instructional facilities allotment uh, is help that we get from the state when we open new campuses, uh, not on the INS or debt service side, but actually in the maintenance and operation of those campuses. So the first year of operation of a new campus, we get a certain amount per child um, on that campus. And then the second year of operation of that campus, the additional, the delta, the additional kids we would get in that second year, we would get some money uh, back for that as well. So as we built and opened five schools in five years, that's that's been a help for us but you know we won't have a, a need for that for quite a while so uh, but that has uh, been something that has been beneficial for us yeah I think some some of it at least in the past was tied to the wealth of the district too I mean sometimes that even became a factor sometimes your poorer districts that were less wealthy sometimes would get you know there were low socioeconomic uh, uh, populations that were, were more were, were larger uh, some of those districts got some special attention also all right, so I'm not going to uh, spend any time really to speak of in terms of your golden pennies and your copper pennies and those things. I think you have dealt with that uh, probably very sufficiently. We'll jump over to page eight and I'll say just a couple of words about tax compression, which you're very aware, aware of. I go back to probably around 2005, the early 2000s, somewhere in that neighborhood. When they that first big compression, I remember what, uh, where your MO tax rate went from a dollar fifty uh, to a dollar. If you were at a dollar fifty, if you're less than a dollar fifty, it actually compressed to less than that. But basically, that's the that's the uh, the model they used. We were at a dollar fifty, and you uh, most districts understood they needed to be at a dollar fifty at that time because the state looked at that to say, well, you know, you're not you're not uh, maximizing your taxing effort if you're not at a dollar fifty. And, and so don't ask us for more money until you maximize it at the local level. So they compressed it to a dollar. That was good for taxpayers, all of us. We all appreciated that. Uh, school districts, again, uh, they've done that tax compression again. And of course, uh, let me back up. You could automatically access, all it took was a vote by the board at that time to, to get four what they call golden pennies, which were weighted on the Austin ISD uh, penny. And um, that helped you immediately. So you could get to a dollar four. Well, now they, they went, so let's just assume you're at a dollar, so you've been compressed down again to 93% or 93 cents. Again, you can access those four pennies back to get to 97. My, the, 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 the sort of the, the yellow flag, I'll call it, maybe it's not a red flag, but the yellow flag is anytime you get compression, sometimes you don't understand or we don't know the real effect of that until maybe a few years down the road. I just don't know. I mean, it's, it seems magical almost that you can go from $1.50 to $1. Uh, they did hold harmless money, so that's how they kind of did that. They did transition grants this time. They didn't call it hold harmless. Some districts qualified for what they called transition grants. Some did not, depending on what you where you stood financially in your district. So you just kind of, it's always kind of keep an eye on tax compression. It's a good thing for taxpayers. We all love it. School districts, we kind of have to kind of keep our eyes open and watch that, though. We're at 97, right? Yes, sir, 93 cents for M&O. We have the four pennies of enrichment. We'll have the opportunity yeah. uh, this next school year as we uh, uh, present the budget and, and tax rate to uh, access one additional exactly. uh, penny uh, without voter approval. And then moving yeah. forward, we'll have the opportunity to do a tax rate election uh, yeah. should we need to. And then there's, you know, there's different constraints with, with all those, but we'll have time to You're talk right. about that yeah. next year. Yeah, you can here. That's good. You can, you can get that other penny next year. All right, so this next one, the no election to approve tax rate, um, is sort of the first of maybe a couple of more that you'll see here in terms of terminology, new, new terminology that you, you kind of want, want going to want to pay attention to. Um, rollback rate, we all heard that term forever. We know what it means. I think the generally probably some of the public knows what it means, not everybody. Um, it's now called the voter approval right. So your rollback right is not really called that anymore. It's called the voter approval right, which you, you may have heard that. Um, as you go down, we're going to go down to the efficiency audits at the bottom, toward the bottom of page eight. So if you wanted uh, to, uh, let's say you wanted to do a TRA, a tax uh, rate uh, election, 
you now have to have what's called an efficiency audit. So here's what it says right here. It says efficiency audit means an investigation of district operations to examine fiscal management, efficiency, and utilization of resources uh, based on standards set by the Legislative Budget Board. Before an election, it says the board must hold an open meeting to discuss the results of the efficiency audit, and those res results must be posted on the district's website not later than 30 days before the election. So you're going to have to do that now if you want to go out for a TRE and go beyond, you know, your your uh, what, what the limits of your your uh, your tax rate there on M and O. Uh, you have to have an efficiency audit, which means you'll have to hire and if someone to come in and do that, pay the money to do that, and then you have to have this. Uh, uh, public uh, meeting to discuss those results. Bond elections, you, you get to do those every so often here because you grow. Facilities maybe get old, you have to replace them, but now you have to put on there, every election has to have this on there according to the way it's written. This is a property tax increase. And, and as it was pointed out to me by a, a board member a few times ago, is that's in all caps. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I think there was a, uh, I don't know if it's so subtle a message that, that was being sent from the state level to the local level uh, constituents. If you go back to rollback tax rate and now it's called voter approval rate, you see this and you're going to see a couple other things here shortly. You begin to get a sense, at least I think from what I've heard from board members, and I believe I feel that way too after doing this many times, they're trying to say to everybody, we're not raising your taxes so much as the local level's raising your taxes. That's kind of the, what the interpretation certainly could be. Whether or not they would admit to that, I don't know. Uh, sure. I don't know if I'm on or not. Am I on over here? Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to ask. I think there's probably been times, or at least we've been very close, when we would go out for a bond, but because our rates were coming coming down, um, it actually would not end up being an increase. <laughs> Has that been asked? Good point. We... So yes, here's here's the answer we, we get on that, is that here's, so exactly, your values have gone up, you go out and pass a, I don't know, let's just say $500 million bond, um, and, or $200 million, or whatever that number is, I don't know what that number <laughs> yeah. is. $100 million. Well, if you're in Conroe, Dr. Asking, Connolly just, does not represent the views no, of no, the administration no. or the board. But I'm thinking right. like a, a Conroe <laughs> or something like that. You can take HISD. Yeah. They did a billion dollar, and, and no, I think it was no tax increase. Well, what they say is, well, in effect, it is a tax increase because you could have reduced your tax rate. That's why they're, they're insisting this language be on here. <laughs> Now, <laughs> now, if you're if you're a small district, you may have to raise taxes thirty cents to to do a a, high, a new elementary or middle school or high school. I mean, it, it, you know, that's a way different situation, uh, and certainly that's a pop property tax increase. But uh, it just is interesting that you have to put that language. You're required to put that on a bond election now. Over to page nine, we're not going to spend really any time on this. You've already done the salary increase thing. You, you understand the 75% and the 30% of the 75% and all those things that you had to contend with uh, actually a few months ago. So, so I'm just going to jump no, in real quick for our three new board members who weren't involved in this conversation. That's true. Yeah. Uh, we, we did, uh, part of the mandates of House Bill 3 was anytime there's an increase in the basic allotment and it went from 5,140 per child to 6,160, um, uh, you uh, must dedicate a certain amount of that uh, increase towards employee compensation. That's at least 30 percent of that uh, of that increase in the basic allotment. Uh, and we in we through the uh, this last our current budget session dedicated 73 percent of that increase towards employee compensation. So uh, and then once that you get to the 30 percent, you know, 75 percent has to be for one level and all that. So we we far exceeded that. Uh, we have to do that not every year. We have to do that every time there's an increase in the basic allotment. And so those are the strictures that have been put into exactly. place for local districts. That's good. Yeah, that's a good uh, add on there. Uh, page. Um, page 10. Yeah, let's put page 10. Uh, you'll see the mentor program allotment real quickly. It's pretty clear on that. The bill adds an allotment for districts that have implemented a mentoring program for teachers with less than two years of experience. Uh, so there's some funds that may be provided for that. And then, of course, there'll be requirements and, uh, that you'll have to meet. 
uh, on that. Reporting non-certified employee misconduct. School districts must report misconduct by non-certified employees to TEA in a manner similar to the way districts currently report certain misconduct by certified employees at uh, 2 SBAC. That's been, uh, been around obviously for quite a while for certified employees. They now have brought everybody else into that, uh, which will be interesting because the next thing they say is there's gonna be a do not hire registry that uh, basically uh, TEA will create, and that's gonna be a, a situation where once these, uh, this list is created, um, you, I, I think, would be looking to see if there are people that apply could potentially be on this list. Now, how they're gonna put this huge, huge list together is gonna be very interesting, and how do you keep it updated, and uh, do people mistakenly get on the list? I mean, you can you can just envision there, there there's going to be a challenge in doing this, but it's a it's an effort made for the right reasons, probably because they're trying to really make sure we have safety in our schools and that we you know there's not any hidden issues going on. But we do background checks already. You would think that would turn it up, and generally speaking, it does. Um, but they're going to create this, and it says TA will create a registry of persons in, ineligible for hire by school districts. There was something in the news. Was it yesterday, day before? about a custodian at one of the school districts that- I apologize, I had not okay. seen, I have not seen that report. Be. But what- I think it was custodial and they, it might've been outsourced where the district outsourced there it, mm -hmm. but there was something with, from my recollection sure. of this, something with that employee, employee of the outsourcing. Do they, do we, well, this is where we're going to wait for rulemaking uh, and see if it's uh, addressed in 114, that particular uh, aspect of it, or in a subsequent update, and then we'll have to see. I, I, I'm guessing your question is, who gets held accountable if it's a third-party outsourced mm -hmm. uh, company? And the answer is, I, I don't know yet, and I'm sure that's what they're going to be working on through rulemaking. Correct, and, I, and just to add a little bit to that, obviously when you, you go to outsource, that's one of the things you're looking at is mm -hmm. how do you vet your people that, that you have employed. So if they're legitimate and you know you, you probably aren't gonna be doing business with somebody that's not, they're gonna be doing background checks and, and vetting that process. Construction or, uh, companies are that way, you can go down the list of, of people that you do contract type work with. No, so, that's well spelled out he's in our right. AIA yeah. construction contracts. Yeah. I have a quick question on the mentoring piece. Mm -hmm. um, it says the bill adds an allotment for districts. Is that built into the basic allotment or is that in addition? Um, it's an additional allotment. I think an it says it add, when it says it adds, it would be an additional you know, allotment. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. And do we have currently have a mentoring so program? So what we have taken is we've had um, new teacher induction, mm -hmm. which became new teacher university, and there's follow-up days throughout the school year. Uh, so what we have, we're, we're working on what new teacher university looks like in the follow-up days with that, and we're really leveraging a new mentoring program. So Mr. Mann, um, our director of instruction and leadership development, has been working this year with the mentors, uh, and we're using assistance principals on the campuses to mm -hmm. serve as mentors uh, for these uh, teachers who are in their first or second year. And it's more comprehensive than the mentor was in, in the past, which is mm -hmm. like, you know, here's how you fill out your substitute plan and you right. know, help and things like this. It's it's a lot more uh, uh, direct instruction and a lot more time. And so it's providing time actually during the school day for our mentors to be able to meet uh, with the, their mentees and provide even more services. So yes, we're leveraging a little bit more uh, resources for that. And we have uh, fundamentally changed our mentoring program. Okay, great. Thank you. Right. And, and, to, and if you wanted to be a part of this, probably the same things that you're doing already might qualify you to get some additional right. funding for this because they do spell out some of the requirements, probably not, not all of them, but some of them here. Okay. I also ask a, a sure. quick question, and I don't need to go too deep into it, but it's back on the misconduct. It seems like a kind of a, a vague word. I mean, where is that defined about what is well, officially misconduct? Here, here, Whether it be a teacher that was in, yes. today in policy or if it's the Correct. New what they say here is, is ha has as a unacceptable criminal history a conviction of placement or deferred adjudication community supervision uh, supervision because of an offense requiring sex offender registration has a conviction of a Title V felony. So you're going to get into the penal code in this these situations pretty much right here. But so that, a lot of it gets down to kind of conviction. It does, and it gets into the you know inappropriate romantic relationship uh, area between you know personnel and students and things like that. It's, it, there's some things that are spelled out in here, if you see those there, possibly. 
And so we have always had the uh, duty uh, and to notify the State Board for Educator Certification if someone is terminated based on an inappropriate relationship with the students or uh, has left uh, under an investigation of that. Now, we don't know if they did or didn't. If they leave and they're under investigation, law enforcement is always involved in that, and so we send that information uh, to the State Board for Educator Certification. That's uh, the, the non-certified uh, employee misconduct is kind of adding that to right. others who work for mm. school system that are non-certified. Yeah. Because we have a lot who work for us who are non-certified. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not necessarily as a result of a conviction. It's just the, an maybe an internal investigation. So the do not hire registry right. is, is going to go based on conviction and conviction. things like that. Okay. And, but I, I, what I wanted the board to understand is we understand our duty to notify the state board for educator certification, and we do on that. And then once that goes there, SPEC has investigators that they work through all that, and okay. then sometimes these folks leave, and we don't know what happens right. to that. So, okay. And I assume that this is going to cross state lines because if you have someone come oh, yeah, in, yeah, it's going to have to if they come okay. if they once they come into our state. Yeah, that probably you're correct. That's a good okay. point. Yeah, they're they're going to be busy with this. Yeah. Uh, this is not going to be easy. I mean, it's it's a uh, it sounds like it's it's a great idea. But, you know, heck, it's hard enough to, to create a list in your own district for certain things. You can imagine creating one for the whole state. Some of that will be very readily available through background checks. I mean, that will be an easy, the easy part of it. For, But you're, you're right, as such as uh, maybe the custodian that was mentioned here earlier, that something, that person was stepped over the line in, in so many words, you know, in a certain area. Well, they could find themselves on a list like this, possibly. So that would be public information, so I... Or do you think it's just access to school districts? Or do you think it's going to be general public? Could the do not hire registry? I would imagine it'd be public, but I don't know. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's geared toward you know all your different types of districts. And if you're a district of innovation, which you are, you you obviously fall in this category. But all districts will fall in this category. But I don't know that this is going to be a list. It does. I don't know that for sure. But I don't think it's going to be something that uh, the generally the public maybe. Couldn't view. I, I don't know. We've got to wait well, to see sure. how the yeah, rules the rule, are written. How the rule, how they and come out with that. Is there a, a typical time frame when TEA is given this kind of rulemaking authority that they, a, they they get it out within six months, a year? You just, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what we see across the board is certain things rise to the top. And, of course, the uh, in terms of the legislation, they put effective dates on these, as we talked about earlier. I don't know what the effective date is on this one. It doesn't say right here. Uh, I think this one is about a year off, if I'm not mistaken. I want to say it's in 2020 that they have to have this list, uh, maybe by the end of 2020. It seems like that's what I was told. In answer to your general question, it, it takes a while to, to, to yeah. develop rules, uh, to get feedback on them, to put them in the Texas Register for feedback, right. take that feedback and process it, and make ultimate decisions uh, on those rules. And yeah. with so many education-related bills and so many that require the input of the commissioner and the Texas Education Agency, it's, a lot of these are going to take quite a while to, to get fully uh, uh, rules fully written. So we'll just... They are. We'll do with what we yeah. can with statute uh, and make our decisions in the best interest, you know, based on what it says actually in statute until we have the rules written. Right. Th this was an extremely, as you can tell already, uh, busy uh, session for public education and charter schools and other, other types of educational services. Uh, and so it's probably the largest one I've ever seen. I mean, in my 40, whatever it's been, 44 years of being around this. Um, it, there's just a ton of stuff, and, and the thing about that is, you know, is, as as uh, Dr. Ely has said, it, it takes a while to for them to to run it through the grinder and the process to get to an end of like, okay, now it's time to start this. We've got to approve it. We've got to have hearings. We've got to post it. You go through this whole lengthy process. And, and, of course, all the while, in some cases, some cases, TEA will be pushing you, districts, you know, from afar uh, to get some things done anyway, uh, that it's coming. So it's, it's a mixed bag on things like that. It really is. But this one, I believe, is not going to be in place in, probably for another year. Uh, it'll take them probably that long to get it put together. All right, let's move to page 11, instruction. 
Yeah, the summer incentive and uh, summer instruction incentive also really uh, its official name is additional days school year. Uh, if you go on uh, TEA's website, you may or may not be aware of this. There's a you can go to House Bill three, and it's HB three and thirty, and they have a series of videos, which you know I'm sure. We review everybody. I don't know if the board wants to do that. You may have seen some of these already. Uh, one of them is this additional day school year, and um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting concept. Um, it says here, it says effective September 1, 2020, so that's next school year. HB3 provides incentive aid for a district that offers an additional 30 days of half-day instruction for students in pre-K through fifth grade. So it is specifically geared for pre-K through fifth grade, not beyond that. Uh, one of the things that, or, or several things come into play here, but as you go through that video, I've gone through it several times. In fact, we did a little presentation on it yesterday at a meeting um, that give you three options in terms of how this can look. Option one is kind of your traditional school. We, you know, all districts or most districts typically have your traditional school year. And then we say we're going to offer maybe it's a summer school of some sort or we're bringing back our ESL kids or we've got some low kids that have not performed well in state assessments. But there's some other mix of how you get kids to do some extended time in this early summer months, typically in the, in the month of June. That's sort of the traditional look. The option two was what's called intercessional, intercessory, and that's where you have intercessions. It's been around for a while. It's, it's, it's called basically year-round school. You've heard that term. That, that came around years ago. Uh, it had its time, it's 15 minutes of in the sun, but, and, and some districts got into it. Some got out of it after they tried it, and I don't think it's quite what it used to be, but that's being kind of brought back out. It's like, you know, what's old is new again. Uh, and that provides some intercessory breaks throughout the year and you stretch your calendar out. The third one though is what's called option three. And I'm giving you a little more detail than what you see here, but option three is uh, a complete redesign of your elementary school program. It's a complete redesign. And it's similar to year round, uh, but uh, it, it's going to be structured a little bit differently. It uh, has to do with the number of days in a calendar for an elementary school, you know, and how many days, uh, teaching days do you have in your calendar. There are certain requirements you have to meet in order to, to, to go this route. They have a grant they're coming out with uh, that uh, will help districts that meet the requirements do this. So. There's a lot more to what you see than this right here, obviously. Uh, that's just a little bit of a glimpse of some of the things that are involved there. So uh, districts are gonna be wrestling with this. Actually, there's, you know, if you, here, here's the real key from what I gather to this is that if, you know, because of the 75,600 minutes, which is what we operate on, you know, some districts, or maybe maybe more than I know of, have you know don't do 180 days of instruction anymore. Maybe and may, because you've met the requirement of the 75,600, and maybe then some, but maybe you get that in in 175 days. Well, in order to be a part of this and get the half day funding, because so this is the carrot right here, they're going to provide half day funding. You have to meet both the 180-day instructional day requirement and the 75,600-minute requirement. So they're 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 ratcheting up because they see what you know they you didn't take a rocket scientist I don't think uh, to to see you know districts are pretty smart the boards and superintendents we all see this hey we can get this done in this amount of time and so that's what we do and so now they're kind of coming back and say well you know okay. But if you want to get this funding for half day, you got to do both. And that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg on that one, but that gives you a little. Right now, I was just going to say at um, Tessa Tasby this year, I met a district, I met some um, school board members from a district that they do a four day week. Yeah, exactly. Good point. They just switched to that. That's exactly right. And, and you know, uh, some of your districts, especially those out in the, you always hear about West Texas because they are so far away and they do travel. That's a pretty desirable. A calendar for a district like that because they can kind of then go with their travel on Fridays 
and not interrupt the academic program as much. But, okay. you know, uh, this is kind of getting, I'm going down a rabbit trail now, I apologize. But, but I, this, this, thing, this pendulum has swung back and forth for years about how many days of instruction. You know, they always want to compare us to Japan or South Korea and Singapore and all these tiny little countries and, you know, that do whatever they do. And that's part of this comparison that you see. If you go in there and look at that video, you'll see that type of comparison made. Not sure that's apples to apples, but um, uh, I would say probably not. But, you know, we've taken these pendulum swings of, of, of days of instruction. You know, sometimes we, we want to extend it to 200 days. Remember that was a deal a few years ago. They kind of backed off. Why? Because the tourism industry is so powerful, you know, and watch for them to kind of come back again. They've been quiet for the last couple of sessions, but some things have changed where now districts are being able to start first week in August. I'm just saying tourism industry is not really keen on that. And they may, we may see them resurface, uh, you know. So Dr. Connelly, I'm just gonna jump in right <laughs> yeah, here. Cool. Uh, Mr. President, sure. members of the board, we've got, uh, we're a little bit before noon. We've been going about 50 minutes now. <laughs> um, and we're on page 11. You're, so, not gonna make, you're not gonna let me get through under two hours today. I can so, um, <laughs> so uh, Mr. President, do we wanna go ahead and go a little bit more before we take a break and grab some sandwiches? You wanna do so now? What's the, what's the direction you'd like for us to go? Go another 10 minutes, all right? Yeah. So maybe we can get that. to a, a stopping point, get through a section. Yeah, so Dr. literacy assessments right below that just basically says, hey, beginning with the 2021 next school year, a district must administer a commissioner adopted reading instrument uh, or a commissioner approved alternative reading instrument to students in the kindergarten level. So that's going to be a requirement. You won't be able to pick and choose your own. They'll have some some selection that he'll have to have approved. Next one, reading standards for kindergarten through third grade. You've heard this, I think, probably. Uh, I won't spend a long time on, uh, on this one, but phonics curriculum, of course, has to be uh, kindergarten through third grade. That's another one of those pendulum swings we see from time to time, from whole language to phonics and in between. Uh, starting in 2020-21, you uh, must uh, ensure that principals in classroom Teachers in kindergarten through third grade attend a teacher literacy achievement academy. That's going to happen. Uh, the one question will be, uh, I think, maybe your physical education, possibly your music and art may not have to do some of this. There may be some of the training they have to go through, but maybe not uh, some all of the training. As of right now, they have to do all of it. We discussed that they do, on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah they have not made that, but that's the sort of unofficial word that Dr. Johnson's gotten is that they're considering that group possibly only having them do part of it, as you said, that has not officially happened yet. And you got two models there, uh, which you may have heard about, the blended model for this and the comprehensive model. I'm not gonna go into detail, but you've heard of that. Pre-K, uh, if you offer pre-K uh, for, uh, for kids who are at least uh, four years of age, you must adopt full day pre-kindergarten. Reading and math proficiency plans, each school board must adopt early childhood literacy and mathematics proficiency plans. And also you've got to set specific goals. You've heard about this, I'm sure that's sort of a big deal for most boards. You have your own either board goals possibly and or superintendent goals, but now three of your board goals will be tied specifically to, to information in here. That would be the uh, early uh, childhood literacy and math. And of course, plans will be developed off that. They have to be on district website. Your goals have to be for, for five years. If you go over to the next page, the third goal of those three is at the top there, college, career, and military readiness, which is CCMR. Same thing there. You gotta set goals for five years and uh, the plan also comes with that. And they must be posted on the district and campus websites. So I think we talked a little bit about that in Transmittal, and that's something that we have to have done by the end of the year going into the next school year. And so that's something that we'll be working on in the spring. So uh, one of the meetings in the spring, you will be seeing these three, uh, or a couple of meetings, these three um, plans come for your approval. Yeah. Yeah, they'll be working on those, and districts are doing that, you're right, already. FAFSA graduate requirement doesn't look like a big deal, but beginning with students uh, enrolled in the 12th grade in 2021, 22, so we've got a little time here. A student may not receive a high school diploma or graduate high school until the student has completed and submitted a free application for federal student aid. So 
there's going to be a requirement that they do that, whether they want to, need to, or, or not. Uh, you, you don't have to do that. Now, next session will be mm -hmm. in play. We'll see if this sticks. It, it very well could, but it very well, in, in, in the interim, some attention may be given to it, and maybe they make some other decisions about that. I think it's definitely going to help the enrollment at colleges. I think it's going to it will. Just from the financial aid. And, and they'll also include here, I didn't read it, but further down it says they're also going to provide an option to decline. In other words, if you accept, if you get this. I think that the, for the smaller districts, what I've heard uh, in particular is that, look, why are we having, why, why is this a requirement that's being forced on our students uh, or us for graduation? And because some kiddos, you know, might be going in just to take over the family business. They've been working in for a few years already, probably. <coughs> And they don't need to do a FAFSA. So, I mean, you have some of that out there, too, that kind of uh, perspective uh, on that. And, and some people tend to think it's just another little, little tiny, little subtle chip away at local control. I mean, that's kind of surfaced a little bit, too. So it kind of depends. But you're right in terms of the higher ed, college level things. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I think that's going to be a, a it's going to help. Yeah. And that, that also ties in, what's, what, and real quickly, what's called, they, I think it was the last session, it's this Texas 60 by 30, 60% 60 of the population will, uh, I can't remember the whole day. But anyway, it's tied into a bigger picture, is what I can tell you, this FAFSA thing is, uh, and a way to accomplish a bigger goal than this. All right, Senate Bill 2, so um, not going to spend a whole lot of time on Senate Bill 2. Because it says here, as you see, many of the changes are not applicable to school districts. But I'm going to show you that's a new vocabulary we were talking about earlier. You see it right there. A taxing unit's effective M&O rate, that's another term we're used to, is now called a no new revenue M&O rate. A taxing unit, i.e. a school board, effective tax rate is now called a no new revenue tax rate. So... You can kind of begin to put the connect the dots here from the first thing we talked about to this and begin to, to develop your own picture in your mind of what, you know, where you think maybe they're, what they're trying to communicate here. Um, deadline to adopt tax rates, you know about that. Uh, we'll skip over that. Page 13, I'm not going to touch on that because that has to do with database, uh, with appraisal districts. Um, we're going to go to page 14. Website posting of tax rate, budget information, or of taxing unit. Each taxing unit, which would be a school school district, must obtain a website to post the following. I'm not going to go through all those bullets, but I will say the very first thing on there is name and official contact information for every member of the taxing unit, i.e. school board, uh, the governing body. You have your name and all that probably on your website somewhere. And I'm going to guess probably here, you, do you all have a, a district email? Or not? Okay, that's good. So you're a lot of you know some of these other districts don't have that, uh, so they're going to be getting uh, district emails to their board members. House Bill 440, use of bond proceeds. Uh, interesting, I guess, to some degree. Um, it says you know you can use, of course, unspent bond proceeds for the specific purposes which the bonds were authorized. Of course, you can retire bonds also with that. If you're having left Bless over. You. Bless you unless the specific purposes are accomplished or abandoned and at a public meeting held for the purpose of considering the use of unspent bond proceeds, uh, the bond approves in separate votes one of these next two things, the use of the proceeds for a purpose other than to retire bonds. So if you got money left over and either you don't need to retire the bonds or you, don't want to choose, or you choose not to use the leftover money to retire bonds, there's a couple other options it looks like here for you. Or you can use the proceeds for a new specified purpose. But you'll have to do that, obviously, in a public meeting, a uh, called meeting by the board. So so that's that's not finishing you know, uh, right. under in a, an elementary school and taking that savings and putting it towards um, deferred maintenance. Because exactly. deferred maintenance was called in the bond in ours. So, uh, so in generally in the past, we have had, obviously, new, new buildings, and we've had some renovation projects, deferred maintenance, mm -hmm. land acquisition, um, buses, and technology. So uh, it would be for a, a purpose outside of those, and we'd have to call a public meeting right. and do all that. Yeah. Now, I, I'm sure you're going to get to this, but you know, bonds are changing moving forward, and, and each of these items are going to have to be separate propositions now yeah, in the future. Well, that so. gonna, yeah, it's in there too. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, page 15, bond election sample ballot. Uh, a sample ballot of the bond election must be posted, of course, on your website for 21 days before the election. Again, now these are law. Uh, uh, people obviously posted things on their website, uh, but for whatever reason, they, I guess, were not in statute. And in some cases, you see they are. And typically, the way things get in here that you see are like, well, we do that anyway. This is what I thought everybody did. Is that obviously somebody or some people were not doing it. And it got the attention of lawmakers, and that's how it gets into to law. House Bill 477, uh, voter information about proposed bond issuance. Um, yeah, you've got more than 250 registered voters, so no, no need to go over that. Senate Bill 30, bond proposition contents, which is some of what uh, Dr. Ely was just referencing. The ballot for a measure seeking voter approval of the issuance of debt obligations must specifically state what they call a plain language description, which is kind of, a, you know, makes sense, I guess, because some of that stuff can be a little bit confusing if, you don't, if you're not keeping up with it. Uh, description of the single specific purposes for which the bonds are being authorized. Toward the bottom of that, it says, oh, however, bonds for the following purposes must be stated in a separate proposition showing the principal amount of the bonds are attributable to, if you go over to 16, it tells you those things that need to be separated out. Construction, acquisition, or equipment of a stadium with seating capacity for more than 1,000 spectators, an auditorium, performing arts facility. It says, then it goes, it says, or recreation facility, but then it says, other than a gymnasium, playground, or play area. So those areas right there considered to be part of what you would typically need in an in a educational environment, a school. Um, Technology is interesting because, yeah, you can include technology in there. It's the type of technology that you're, you're in. So what they say is that you're also going to have to put that out as a separate proposition on acquisition and update of technology equipment other than equipment used for school security. That doesn't have to be in there. Uh, our technology infrastructure integral to the construction of a facility. So those things that you need that are integral to construction of a facility, you don't have to have a separate proposition for those. That's part of part and parcel of the the, uh, the primary bond if you're building something. Probably to some degree, uh, this goes back uh, to if you're a district that is struggling to find ways to replace equipment, i.e. Uh, computers, for example, whatever they may be, printers, what, those types of things. There have been districts, of course, that have done that. And I suspect that some of this is geared toward that because that's not a good use of your bond money, which is typically, what, 30-year bond money, usually? Yes, and sir. usually if you're buying computers, you're going to get maybe five years out of them. Maybe, maybe in down days, maybe less. So uh, not, a, not a good use there. And I think that's where some of that uh, came from. Just, uh, and it's yeah. been our practice in College Station ISD to amortize the debt uh, for those uh, technology purchases and vehicle purchases down to five to seven there years. So yeah. that's, that is, what we do, uh, that has been our practice here, not to pay for an iPad for 30 years. There you go. <laughs> um, elections, House Bill 831, residency requirements. Well, this has to do with uh, someone that may need to uh, have a temporary absence from, from their elected board position. Uh, so it says it defines uh, residence as one's home and fixed place of habitation to which one intends to return after a temporary absence. You can kind of read into that a lot of different things, however you want to. I, I kind of, one of the things I read into is if you've got an emergency situation, something personal where you have to be somewhere up in North Texas or down wherever you are far away for several months, maybe it's a, maybe it's a family member, a parent that needs your special attention, you, and maybe it ends up being months sometimes. That's a, what I think, because your residence is still where it is. It's here, but you're having to be away for an extended period of time. There are some situations, it's, where it goes on to say these requirements do not apply to a person displaced from the person's residence by a declared disaster. So like Hurricane Harvey, for example, that, that's not uh, that. We have seen a situation just where in a district, a board member in our region actually lived, we'll just say in the Dallas area, uh, had a property, because that's where they grew up, but really the only time probably they were there was probably, you know, board meetings and things like that. So 
there, there, it's, it's a, I think that's probably what it's trying to address is that type of situation so that people don't really live somewhere else but then come back to make decisions for this local community that they really don't live in maybe necessarily most of the time. Um, eligibility, uh, 2283 you see there, uh, you're ineligible to serve as a school board trustee if a person's been convicted of a felony. You think that's a duh, but uh, it needed to be in there. If you're already on the board and that has the case, because this was not in statute, you can finish your term and you cannot run again. And I usually move on pretty quickly from this one. <laughs> <laughs> Just so, so we don't have to have a lot of discussion about that. So um, it would be a good time. We're good moving time. into an good accountability yeah. now to maybe take a break, Mr. Yeah. President. Yes, sir. We'll take um, 10 minutes, sure. get lunch, and then we'll come back. You ready to we'll get started again. Okay. Yeah, let's, uh, while y'all are eating, if you need to get up and do whatever you need to do, don't hesitate to do that. And we'll just try to roll through this as quickly as can. I know some of you need to get back to work. And um, I'll try to get you out of here quickly if, I, if we can. Accountability, House Bill 3906, uh, testing subjects and grades. Uh, you're probably aware, uh, starting in 2021, it says um, it's going to eliminate the separate writing assessment in grades four and seven. That sounds like that it's going away. It actually is not totally going away. I believe it'll be collapsed somehow into maybe the reading exam. It's going to be embedded into the reading yeah. assessment, grades three through eight. Right. So, um, which gets you into a little bit of, uh, if you go down to um, assessment format, a little bit further down the page there, that's in 22, 23, this is effective. Uh, the 75% of, of the uh, EOC in grades three through eight assessment instruments, you, it can't consist of more than 75% multiple choice questions. So that writing piece will somehow probably help offset the, uh, the will help them meet that requirement there, I'm gonna guess. Um, Pre-K, kindergarten, uh, prohibitions, uh, nothing of real urgency there except that um, it says that Prohibits the administration of a state accountability assessment to a kindergarten student, uh, you know, unless the purpose is to determine an underage student's eligibility for enrollment. Basically, on that one, uh, that was during the House Bill Three negotiations. Right. I believe the Senate uh, put something in there about a kindergarten assessment be used for accountability purposes. That was stripped out of House Bill Three and put <laughs> into some of these things we're putting in 3906. Right. And someone wisely put in caveat to say we will not be using a kindergarten assessment for state accountability purposes. Mm -hmm. So that seems odd. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> it says to determine underage student eligibility. Yeah. yeah. Is uh, it just? Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Is it just as odd that unle the unless part of it to determine um, eligibility? No, that's been uh, that's been in statute for a number of years uh, for students who are not yet six before uh, right. before starting first grade. Uh, then there's an ability for them to go directly into first grade should they pass certain oh, uh, okay, certain okay, instruments to prove yeah. readiness for that. So that's been there for a long time. Okay, right. Won't spend much time on page 18. Uh, I don't think this is real applicable to you at all. In fact. But if you were doing a, some sort of a turnaround plan for a campus that was really in trouble, uh, this is one of the state's options right here. It's called the Accelerated Campus Excellence or ACE Turnaround Plan. Uh, and I won't, I won't spend any time on it, but just to let you know, it is there, and that's an option the state provides now. Going over to governance, page 19. Um, in particular, uh, I think the uh, House Bill 1495 deals with the lobbyist issue and the first piece right there uh, in terms of, this is the bill adds to the disclosure requirement a contract for, uh, disclosure requirement a contract for services that re require a person to register as a lobbyist. But that next one says budget itemization for expenditures influ influencing legislation or administrative action adds a requirement that the proposed budget of a political subdivision including, of course, a school district, must include a line item indicating expenditures for directly or indirectly influencing or attempting to influence the outcome of legislation or administrative action. So, um, TASA, TASB, you can go down the list. All those groups that work on the behalf of public schools, uh, some in charter schools, and certainly for school boards sometimes gives you a voice 
uh, there's some things that are going to have to. They're, they're, they they really are trying to to shut this down. Uh, I guess it is a, is the direct way of saying it. Uh, so those uh, we have fought, been fighting back. Real estate agencies that we work with, uh, Texas Association of School Boards, Texas Association of School Administrators, uh, they're they're working through the rulemaking process as right. well. And what will probably will happen is, you know, we, we pay dues and fees to be involved with these programs. They will figure out what percentage or what amount of what we pay goes into their lobbying efforts. And then we can use, we can itemize that and pay for that out of that budget line item. So right. really nothing is changing other than an accounting uh, situation. And there was, of course, a, a real effort by certain people up there to... Senate Bill 29. Yeah, they're try, trying to get rid of all this together. House Bill 963, trustee information posted on website. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but just so you know, yeah, the, uh, your email address, term of office, uh, including the date to, uh, the term began, the date the term ends or expires, uh, that's going to have to be posted. Also, there's some other things uh, in 305 there, including school districts that you must post uh, online, uh, each elected officer of the political subdivision, and on page 20, at the top, the date and location of your next election, requirements and deadline for candidacy filing. So nothing really probably too out of the ordinary. You may be doing a lot of that already. If not, you'll, you'll want to pay attention to those things. Open Meetings Act, uh, I'm not going to, uh, we'll, again, uh, this was mentioned. So you're very much aware of the public participation that must be allowed. So I'm not going to spend any time on that and the, and the reasonable rules or how you kind of guide that in your own district. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time okay. on it though, John. Uh, <laughs> it's good. Since, since we have three new board members, okay. uh, this is a change, um, and it, we had to slightly modify our board operating procedures. Um, and so what the this new law states is that uh, at any posted uh, meeting, uh, the public uh, must be allowed to provide comment uh, on that uh, on an agenda item, not on non-agenda items. Uh, but on agenda items. So that's why we had on our earlier meeting, and that's why we had in this meeting, you see public comment. If somebody wanted to provide comment on a legislative update, we would do that. Uh, and it has to happen before or during consideration of that agenda item. That is, we've done that always in the past. We, we've, we've always uh, had public comment at the consideration of the agenda item. So that didn't change anything in regards to our non-agenda items. We still have that information. We still have that ability to do that in regularly called meetings, the ones that we do uh, on the third Tuesday of the month that start at 7 o'clock. Um, we had to change up some of the time uh, lines, and we uh, we had information there. Uh, uh, if more than five people wanted to speak on a subject, then they would elect a uh, a uh, representative, we can't do that anymore, so that's been stricken. So, uh, as I said, we we made these updates in October. I mean, in August, excuse me. And uh, I don't believe they're going to have to make any changes as a result of of, of update one fourteen. But we'll see. Yep. And that, what he just described was the reasonable rules. You get to decide kind of what those reasonable rules are, and then that's how you operate. Might not prohibit public public criticism. Well, that kind of goes without saying, but uh, it's it's a. And statute may not prohibit public criticism of a governmental uh, body, including um, criticism of an act or mission policy procedure, et cetera, uh, does not apply to public criticism that is otherwise prohibited by law. So whatever public criticism may be prohibited by law uh, is, is not applicable here. Uh, Senate Bill 494, open government uh, during emergencies, uh, catastrophes. Basically here, obviously, you had needed to post two hours prior if you were gonna call for an emergency meeting. There's only certain things you could call an emergency meeting for. That's been reduced to one hour now that you have to post, which I think was a good move. <clears throat> it goes on to talk about uh, what sort of are the examples or the conditions that uh, would make up an emergency meeting or require that. Well, you can see those under conditions for emergency or urgent public necessity, fire, flood, earthquake, tornado, and so forth. Uh, epidemics, uh, civil disturbance, I mean, you know, uh, all kinds of things. These are examples, it says, uh, that, that match or the uh, existing Open Meetings Act. Suspension of, of the Public Information Act during catastrophes. During a catastrophe, a uh, school board in this case may elect up to two time periods during uh, which compliance with the PIA is suspended. So basically they're giving you the opportunity because things could be rather hectic 
you may be in the midst of a real such a, a crisis that doesn't allow maybe for you to break away uh, previously every so many hours to give an update. Uh, you're fortunate here. You do have personnel that maybe you could still do this. Districts that don't have that uh, really would be in a bind. And I think that's what they're trying to, to help out with it somewhat. But you can uh, you can suspend that for a period of no more than seven days to give an update, and then you actually get another uh, extended seven day period that you can you can, can uh, take into effect also. Senate Bill 1640 down at the bottom. Uh, Prohibited uh, series of communications. So it says here, it says, shouldn't be news to anybody, but it's, it's now a crime for a member of a governmental body to knowingly engage in at least one communication among a series of communications that each occur outside of a meeting authorized by the Open Meetings Act. <coughs> Same stuff you've been here, you knew that as a board member, or if you're new on the board, there are certain things that you, you, you want to stay away from. One is what they call a floating or, or moving type quorum. And if you go on the page 22, uh, toward the end of that top paragraph, it says, in other words, board members still need to avoid walking quorums by limiting their conversations and written exchanges about school business with fellow board members outside of public meetings. That's always something you have to watch out for, always board members do. And, uh, you know, you can still hang out with each other. You can you be at the game or be at a concert or wherever you're at a play, and you can still congregate and talk, but you just have to be careful what you talk about. And if it's school business, you just kind of need to stay away from that. Because remember, obviously, there are people around you. They may listen, and that's how a rumor gets started, possibly, in a community. Uh, and and um, I've seen some things come of that, that that are out of the ordinary, but I've seen some things come of that in the past. I'm going to go, I'm not going to uh, cover uh, 943. This is getting into construction, contracting issues. I'm going to skip, we're going to go over to page 24. Mm -hmm. Senate Bill 944 uh, talks about the uh, temporary custodians of public information. This is a public information issue, and basically it's saying that information held by a temporary custodian is subject to records preservation, retention, and disposition requirements. Typically, in many districts, the, the, the superintendent is a public information officer. Uh, that may be the case. You may have someone here that already obviously mm -hmm. does that. Uh, but anyone that, that has access to information, they are temporary custodians of that information for the district, and so it's subject to retrieval. Information on personal devices provides that a current or former employee or officer of a governmental body has no personal or property right to public information recreated or received while acting in an official capacity. Um, it talks about, you know, uh, all current and former officers and, and employees who maintain public information on a privately owned device well, that no longer, of course, it's been that way for a while, I guess now, you no longer have any privacy rights on this. If it's school business and they want to come and they want to ask for all your emails or your text messages, it, it's your phone, you pay for it, but it's subject to open, uh, open records request, Public Information Act. So, um, and, and the bill goes on to talk about, um, you have to hold on to that. Uh, you do. For the length of the district's um, policy on electronic records retention. So our policy on electronic records retention for the district is one year. One year. So uh, anytime this is not, um, th this is about when you're discussing school business. So if somebody's running late to a meeting and says, be there in five, that's, that's known as transitory. Right. Um, if, you know, what do you, what do we wear into the board meeting? You know, that, that, that is not anything yeah. but. Right. Right. So, right. Yeah. Uh, no. Right. Um, and so, uh, right. so it, it is the it is the duty of the employee, and it's the duty of the public servant. So each of the seven of y'all to to retain that. So uh, if should you have some deliberation on there, obviously you wouldn't have done that with, you know, with a walking quorum or anything like that, uh, and you should not do. But if there was something that came up. Uh, that was on there or something with me, uh, then you would need to keep a copy of that. And you can just not erase it from your phone or you can uh, make a 
screen copy of it or you can download it to a Google Drive or whatever, but it'll be up to you um, to make sure you have that because we get an open records request, Chuck will come and be asking for that. There you go. That makes sense. House Bill 403, uh, training on child abuse. It's going to be required for every uh, school board member, every uh, trustee, every two years. You have to have an hour of this training uh, dealing with uh, potential victims of sexual abuse, human trafficking, and other maltreatment of children. Bless you. We are developing, bless you, we are developing that uh, currently as I speak at, I know, at our service center to make this available for trustees so you can take that online. It's not the type of training that typically we should have to come out probably and do for you, but you, you have to have it once every two years. Superintendents, likewise, have to have it uh, two and a half hours every five years on the same topic. So we'll be doing something with that also. Page 25, uh, 3834, and uh, actually 820, that whole page right there is dealing with cybersecurity training. Very important cybersecurity, as you know, I'm sure y'all are much more up on this than maybe some of the places I may go to, but um, very, very uh, much. I think it's going to be increasingly so. And we've had, I think I was told uh, this year alone already, at least seven districts that we know of in the state of Texas that have been uh, uh, yeah, hijacked. Uh, yeah, for lack of a better word for me, you're right. That's exactly right. And, and so it's, it's a problem. Uh, muni municipalities, hospitals, we know around the country, that's ticked up quite a bit. So some real uh, uh, attention is being given to this. DIR, which is the Department of Information Resources, is going to kind of lead the way. And they're approving programs that, for training for people in your schools and then also for school board members. You also, because uh, it says must identify employees who have access to local government computer systems or databases require those employees, which includes board members, um, to complete a cybersecurity training program. Certified by DIR. 820 does something a little differently. You've got to adopt a cybersecurity policy. You may be working on that. I don't know if that's happened yet or not. To secure district cyber uh, infrastructure against cyber attacks, other incidents, uh, your risk assessment, and then uh, implementation of a mitigation plan. So a lot going on there. Uh, you've got to have your cybersecurity coordinator uh, identified and be a liaison between the district and TEA. And then there's the data breach issue uh, at 4390 down there. Must disclose a breach of system uh, security without unreasonable delay. And within 60 days after the data breach was determined to have occurred. Of course, you all, we all hear about data breaches all the time with major credit cards and so forth, so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, but that now applies also to us. I'm um, not going to talk much about construction here on page 26. I am going to just briefly point out a couple of things just of note on page 27. House Bill 793 says added a requirement that a company verify, verify that it does not and will not boycott Israel in order to enter into a contract with a governmental entity, including a school district. Just saying. May 7th, <laughs> we'll see That's in there. And the next one, Senate Bill 22, prohibits... Uh, a, including a school district, obviously, from entering into a taxpayer resource transaction with an abortion provider or an affiliate of an abortion provider. And I think the affiliate was probably where the challenge can be, because sometimes you don't may not see that up front, and maybe down the line there may be some some people, resources in the background. But anyway, that's what, that, that's what Senate Bill 22 is all about. Um, let's move on to page 28, curriculum instruction and graduation. You know, if, if you got a kid, and, and believe it or not, there still are some kids, I'm not sure about in your school district or not, but there's still are kids that don't have access to reliable technology. If that's the case, since we do a lot of things sometimes now with technology, whether it's, you know, through Google or whatever we're doing with uh, that, that an instruction, you've got to provide instructional materials in a printed format so the student may take them home. I believe we probably do that already, so I don't know that this is an issue, but it's now a law. 1244, interesting, uh, U.S. history, and of course. Um, yeah, you're going to have to include, uh, they're going to include 10 questions randomly selected from the naturalization civics test uh, that's administered by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. That will be on the end of uh, course assessment. So they're going to take 10 questions from that and put it on the EOC. Um, 
213, graduation committees. It just extends the use of individual graduation committees. Uh, House Bill 1597 is with your uh, armed forces, military active duty. Basically just says, look, some of these, obviously families will move around several times, potentially during a year. We oftentimes say, hey, we've got to have certain uh, requirements met before we can enroll your child. They're saying, no, if they've got an official letter, from the, the military saying they've been transferred to your area, which means your school district, you're to enroll those, those students. And then the other information will follow. Page 29, uh, homestead students. Uh, another interesting one here, requires a, a district to admit an eligibility, uh, eligible student if the student either parent reside in a residence homestead that is located on a parcel of property, any part of which is located in the district. Previously, if you're on uh, your homestead was on somewhere where the district line came right through your home, how did they determine which district you went to? Where the improvement lies. Well, that and also where the bedroom was, the master bedroom. Now, that's probably, you we, can see different things that happened there. But we, we haven't had to get to that level of granularity. <laughs> we do have some that bisect some of our property lines, so we're well aware of that. So now, <laughs> if any part of that homestead touches your, they can pick College Station, for example, or you know, however, they, however that would look, yeah. Um, conservators' uh, right to attend school activities, that's unless it's limited by a court order, of course, a parent appointed as a conservator always has the right to attend school activities. All right, so we're gonna move into student health and we're gonna get into some safety stuff here. Um, I'm gonna tell you that probably from here on out, generally speaking, what, we, what we're gonna quickly go over is not what you typically spent your time on in schools in the you know years past, but because of the climate that we're in, the environment that sometimes we find ourselves in and what how things have evolved over the years, this all is a very much a part of our day now, a part of what Dr. Ely and everybody deals with and, and the you as a school board deal with. So House Bill 3703, Compassionate, uh, Texas Compassionate Use Act, allows qualified physicians to prescribe low THC cannabis to patients diagnosed with you know, a variety of things, epilepsy, seizure disorder, and you can go through that list that they give you there. Uh, it needs to be a board certified person that really they sort of specialize in this area. A, 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 a large part, part of their practice deals with this. So it's a good, good for people obviously that need that type of relief and have those pains that have been documented that this works well. Uh, I always say, you know, any good deed does not go unpunished. And so this is an example of probably of things, you, you know, someone's gonna work the system here. You don't know how yet, but it'll happen. I'm, I feel certain of that. That's typically what, what, what you see. So, um, but it's a good, good uh, law for the right reasons. 76, House Bill 76, cardiac assessment. You may know about this. Uh, certain UIL activities are gonna require you to provide information about sudden, sudden cardiac arrest and electrocardiogram testing. Um, I think the only question may be, and I'm not sure if y'all deal with this already, is because I'm not, I'm not heard, but who actually pays for this? So the student could actually require, the parents could require, uh, say, hey, we would like to take advantage of an electrocardiogram. So who pays for it? I don't know if that's actually been said yet. I haven't seen that. Um, House Bill 496. This is one of those things that's a result of, of, of the times we live in. Traumatic injury response protocol has, has to be in place by January 1, coming up 2020. But it's got to in include what's called the bleeding control stations, which y'all probably have already addressed, Mike. Yes, yeah, Cesar, you're going So to. as Mrs. Perry pointed out uh, on Tuesday, that's the Stop the Bleed that we've yeah. worked with uh, yeah. uh, community uh, partners with. And so we've we've been in receipt of those uh, bleeding control kits. Cool. That's great. I'm sorry, can I ask a question about the electrocardiogram? Sure. Yeah. Just so I understand. So must provide students who participate in certain UIL activities with information about mm -hmm. sudden cardiac arrest and electrocard so they can it as i'm reading it the student can request to have an electrocardiogram yeah. if they choose that's right request of the administration does that imp I, I don't know if, well they can the they can request the administration of electrocardiogram in addition to a physical exam so they have the they have the, apparently the right to request that i said the question was right who, who pays, pays for, for it, it? Yeah. I don't know. We don't know. It's just providing information. So well, initially it says, and then it says, 
it actually administration of that. But the administration yeah. of an electrocardiogram. So you're going to give the information about it for certain at your physicals. They do right. that. We've been doing that maybe for a little while. But now hmm. it's also that uh, they can re request. Now, there are programs out there. You may have seen, I've seen them on the news and things where people have put together programs with them where they go in and they, on a Saturday, they're providing this electrocardiogram free through this, this group that's, you know, sponsoring a, a particular uh, cause, if you will, related to this. So um, I don't know, though. That, that's, I haven't seen the fleshed out part of this. Um, need to find hmm. out what, what that actually is going to look like. I made a note where I've got to go back and look at the bill text yeah. first okay. and yeah. then look at the, we'll look at the bill text and then we'll see how the law, uh, how the rules are written for it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, page 30 and uh, school nurses role in concussion uh, oversight. Really what this says is the nurse now has the authority to determine if they believe someone because of what their actions or what they observe uh, is concussed and they can actually, according to this, make a decision to remove that particular student from an interscholastic uh, athletics practice or competition. They don't have to be on the, on the oversight team. You know, you have an oversight team that does this. They can request to be on it, but they don't have to be. So that's a nurse has been given a little more of an expanded role here. Asthma medication, uh, 2243 there, says the board may, it doesn't say you must, says you may adopt a policy authorizing the school nurse to maintain and administer unassigned prescription asthma medicine under a standing order, which you would get from a physician, to a student whose parent has provided notice that the student has been diagnosed with asthma and has given written permission for the nurse to administer the asthma medicine. Well, unassigned means it's not assigned to anyone. She, this nurse has an unassigned prescription in their office but there needs to be some notification for parents that it's okay that they've been diagnosed, that type of thing. Anything else you've heard about that? No, I mean, okay. we, we obviously have kids who come to the, sure. to the clinic all right. the time and need an inhaler. Uh, so this gives um, the schools more flexibility to have those on yeah. hand should the kid not have theirs. Yeah, and that, that, that's yeah. a good thing. Okay. Uh, along with that, the next one's also, I think, a good thing, uh, emergency administration of epinephrine, which is your bee stings and things like that. You know, we've had some laws in place for that for a while. Well, they're going to authorize uh, the possession and emergency administration of epinephrine by trained peace officers now. So that's a good thing. Uh, we're going to skip over to page 30. Well, real quickly. Mind if I ask a quick question yeah, no, about the ahead. health part? I just, sure. Um, and it's actually more for Dr. Ely. It's no, that's okay. the concussion part of it. I mean, how many folks are required to get trained about concussions throughout and how to deal with them throughout our school? Is that something that's currently required? or It is required for certain groups of employees, Coaching. but I can't tell, tell you, you how exactly many who and, and who we do. So I apologize. I just don't have well, that at my you're, fingertips. You're, yeah, and you, you're, you're coaching staff. Uh, where, mm -hmm. you know, and then there are others, like you said, mm -hmm. could be too. Training, yeah. so. Right, yeah. Sure. Train, if you got trainers, yeah, people like that. Uh, real quickly, the uh, Texas uh, Department of Emergency um, Management, all you need to know here is that it was once in DPS. It's no longer there. It's been moved to right here in College Station to Texas A&M University. So, <laughs> so they're in charge of this now, okay? So things that happen, you can see those bullets of all the types of things they'll be dealing with. Also down at the bottom, one good thing I think they put in here is that they must establish a program to provide short-term loans for disaster recovery projects, which is an issue for a lot of people, certainly school districts, if things happen suddenly and there's no money to replace or start rebuilding. Page 32, uh, school safety obviously got a lot of attention. As much, the, the big house bills you heard about, House Bill 3, spent a lot of time on that one. That's the one you remember. Senate Bill 11 is the other big one. You mentioned that earlier. Uh, house Bill 18 gets into mental health, stuff like that. But this was huge. Uh, we'll go over this real quickly. Uh, uh, school marshals, they basically just removed the cap. Prior, it was one per every 200 students and they had a, a limit, the caps have been removed on that. So you can have more than that if you desire and you want to implement the school marshal plan. Um, active shooter response training, it just requires districts to include that in your uh, multi-hazard emergency operations plan, the EOP, uh, for responding to an active shooter emergency. Again, this is the world we live in. This is the things that you have to think about Teachers walk in, administrators walk in, students walk into their buildings every day. And in, in years past, 
uh, we didn't really have to think about those things. We do now. We think about them probably every day. And, and there's reasons for all this. And so you have to have a lot of things you're getting ready to hear about, which you've already heard about most of this uh, in place. Senate Bill 11, uh, school safety and mental health promotion. Of course, Governor Abbott, as a result of Santa Fe, they came together, they had this big summit for two or three days, came out of it with a 40 point plan, you may recall, uh, the governor's 40 point plan. What they did, they went in and they funded it at $9.72 per student in ADA. So it's a start, you know, depends on the size of the district as to how much you get. I don't think anybody gets a lot of resource money from that particular piece right there. Uh, you can do the math and pretty well figure that out. It's not gonna go very far. But that, they can say they, they uh, started on the process. I guess that's what they say with that. One but the, of the, but the good news go is that it is an allotment, so it is in, it is in statute That's now. true, yeah. So it's yeah. harder to take that's that away right. without actually updating the statute and removing a, uh, a school safety allotment, and that would be hard to do. Very, so, very much. Uh, then it becomes an appropriation issue. Can we? Uh, how much can they appropriate each biennium for that? And so it started off with a much, much bigger number, and it's a very small number, but at least we have that in, in statute now. Yeah. And you see the last thing there's talks about guidance from the Texas School Safety Center. So I'll tell you, just so you know, I mean, they are the go-to, they're the lead dog here in the state. They're, they're going to be the leader of the pack. They, they were before when they were first established some years ago, but things were pretty quiet in Texas. We didn't have any major issues, so they cut their funding 33%. Um, that funding is back and then some now. So uh, they have taken back over their lead role. Districts are really, and we, I know the ESC, we're really used as a resource as, as well as school districts. Um, basically, uh, one thing I'll point out on page 32 at the bottom, waiver of operational minutes. You can get a waiver of up to 420 minutes of operation. It's about seven hours, so that's a typical school day uh, for uh, if a district requires for some training, for uh, school safety training. Um, that's approved by the Texas uh, School Safety Center. All right, page 33. Curriculum changes. You can see health curriculums expanded and include both physical and mental health. One thing I'll point out to you is School Health Advisory uh, Council called SHAC. You're aware probably of that committee. They've been around for a while uh, and somewhat active, I guess, to some degree, make recommendations. They just got thrown into the middle of the fire here. I mean, they are really going to be an active uh, committee in your district. Uh, again, they make recommendations. They don't set policy, but they'll maybe bringing recommendations possibly to you to consider. Um, Let's see, uh, let's go down to multi-hazard EOPs and audits. Uh, the school safety centers, as I said already, is the lead entity here. Um, school districts must su submit their EOPs to the school safety center. It says on request or in accordance with the schedule, and there will be a schedule coming out from, from the school safety center. Uh, but here's the deal, once if, you know you have yours in place, we hope that all districts do, uh, because there are gonna be some consequences uh, that's how seriously they're taking this, of course, now. And if you go down to consequences for noncompliance, it says there that uh, if a district receives notice from the school safety center that it's not in compliance, the board must conduct a public hearing with detailed notice to the public and written notice to attendees about the deficiencies in the plan. Uh, if a district fails to submit an EOP to the school safety center, the commissioner may appoint a conservator. So they're putting some teeth into this law. To, to order the district to adopt an EOP. If the district does not comply with the conservator's order, uh, he can appoint even so far as a board of managers to operate the district. So they're, they've obviously had to get pretty serious about this and probably should be, no doubt. Uh, another one that's gonna see a lot of activity is your school safety and security committee. You have had that probably already. They will be uh, adding some additional positions in terms of you know, maybe uh, expertise they may have. Uh, they're supposed to meet at least three times per year, typically in the fall, the spring, and the summer, uh, and they're subject to the Open Meetings Act. They're going to have a lot to say about what you're doing in your district. Um, notice of threats, you do this probably already, but you're supposed to do that as, as soon as possible. Uh, make parents aware if there's been a, a, a bomb threat or terroristic threat made. Uh, the threat assessment teams, that's a new team 
within the overall scope of things, uh, yeah, you're supposed to, and you probably have done that, establish a threat assessment and, and uh, team. It's got to be, uh, have the, uh, the requisite expertise that they would like to see in these teams include mental health, safety, law enforcement, special ed, classroom management, a wide array of expertises uh, uh, that will show up in this particular team. And you're going to uh, gather and analyze data to determine the level and risk and appropriate intervention of each student. It sounds, it is a very significant team, by the way, uh, but it's really going to be more about how do we help students. In other words, we, we notice these things, so what do we, part of the response is how do, what, what, what are we going to do to, to, to assist students that are maybe showing some tendencies that, that fall in the, in the categories that they shouldn't be falling in, uh, into. Uh, this is kind of bleeding over, obviously, into the mental health issues, you know, and you're going to see that. So consent for treatment, before a student under 18 may receive mental health services, parental consent is required that complies with state and federal law and provided by the district. Um, we'll go down to uh, trauma-informed care training. Each district must adopt a policy on trauma-informed care, addresses methods for increasing staff and parent awareness of trauma. That's a term that we never, ever, ever heard in public education. That was for your emergency medical people, hospitals, doctors. Well, those are the types of terms that are in the educational realm now and, uh, and are in uh, trauma-informed care for, is one of those. Availability of mental health resources. Part of the role of the ESC is going to be to help identify and report to the state some programs that look good, best practices. Ultimately, though, TEA is going to uh, produce a statewide plan for mental health services. That hasn't happened yet. That's going to take some time. You can, you can be assured of that. I have a quick question sure. before we go on. Yeah. Um, on the threat assessment teams, do we have those in place? So we, we have the, the earlier models of threat assessment teams okay. that we have uh, at, at each campus. And so that is <clears throat> one of the things that we're going to have to do by board action is have the, basically the district kind of threat That's what I was about to come. Okay. So yeah. we will take board action on developing and, that? Uh, on approving the committee membership okay. of that, yes. So, okay. And that's upcoming. Got it. Thank you. I got a follow-up question. Oh, sure. too. Yeah. So... Where it says teams must gather and analyze data to determine the level of risk and appropriate intervention for each student. Uh -huh. Do we know what that means yet? I mean, is there going to be like an evaluation of every student within the district? So, cur so, cur uh, so currently, the emergency operations plans do go through that assessment risk for each of our facilities. Uh, each, each one of them has a different physical plant, different student makeup, you know, uh, other different challenges. So we go through those and rate those as a part of the development of the emergency operations plan. What it means for each student, I don't know what that's going to exactly I, entail. What else? What I will add to that in, in response to your question, too, we had uh, the School okay. Safety Center, I believe, came and did a program at the end of October. And I did not get to go to that, but what I was told was that what you see here and what and how this is practically applied is not quite the same. In other words, this makes it look like that you're going to be spending a lot of time. So, I mean, when I first read this, I thought, gee whiz, this committee will probably be meeting every week, and in some cases maybe more than that. But that's really, I don't think, the case. Now, could it be that some districts have those types of issues where require them to gather more information? But, but I think they're going to be coming together to analyze, as it says, data. It does say what you said there, appropriate intervention for each student. I just don't think that means every student. I think it may mean the students that, that sort of are noticeable, that rise to the surface, if you will, that you've got some concerns. We've got somebody that's maybe, maybe they're a loner, maybe they're, you know, the, the obvious thing is you know, someone's wearing a trench coat. I mean, Things that are signs, what are the, the, you've heard some suicidal talk, uh, uh, someone's heard this from this particular student, you're going to get that kind of data sent probably, and maybe it'll be funneled to this uh, group, I, I'm not sure, as, as uh, Dr. Lee said, that's going to have to be further developed, I think, before we know the extent of how, how, how far reaching it is. I would hazard a guess at this point yeah. until we see. It's hard to know saying. exactly. Well, I just would point out that the sentence prior to that does say that it, they will conduct the threat assessments for individuals who actually make threats or violent 
It does. Yeah. So I don't know if then that next that sentence probably, applies just to yeah, those yeah, you're right. students or to. Yeah, and I think that's probably a good connection there. You're right. Oh, yep. There you go. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Mrs. McAdams. So it, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily be doing every student, but but those that are showing these signs that she just pointed out. Those are the ones that are going to draw your attention to them. Um, page thirty five. This is House Bill 18, another pretty big bill. This gets into the specifically into mental health. Um, as extensive training for new teachers, uh, basically saying, hey, it's going to now be, you're going to have, a, they're going to have a requirement to have at least 25% of their training be in areas that have some connection to mental health. And you can see what those are. They talk about classroom effectiveness, uh, digital learning, um, identifying students at risk of dropping out, et cetera, with special needs. Shack, you see Shack specifically mentioned here again. Uh, it says they must issue several new statements, including a statement of the policies and procedures adopted to promote the physical health and mental health of students. They've never had to do that before, but they're going to need to do that. <clears throat> In addition, it says each campus, Shack must post a statement of whether the campus has a full time nurse or a full time counselor. You'll be in good shape there. Some districts don't have that, uh, we'll call it uh, benefit to have them on every campus necessarily. Page 36, uh, House Bill 19. Uh, eventually, we're going to be hiring as a result of some uh, 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 agencies and, and people getting together uh, to hire a uh, mental health expert, we'll call it resource, that will be housed at Region 6 in this case. All the regions will have this, but we'll have one at Region 6. That has been pushed back a year. I do know that. That won't happen until sometime later in 2020. And that will become a resource for all the districts and everybody in regions, Region 6. It'll be one person, but that's, that's a start. That's a good start right there. Senate Bill 1707, just as about law enforcement. Really what you're trying to do here is establish some, some guidelines for law enforcement duties of peace officers at the schools. That's kind of gotten blurred in some places, some places not, but it has gotten blurred. It says, uh, if you go to that second par paragraph, the uh, school district peace officers, or if you've got SROs or your own police department, must perform law enforcement duties, and districts may not assign officers routine student discipline. That's not their job. Uh, school administrative task or contact with students unrelated to the officer's law enforcement duties. And so, you know, that just probably need to be clarified a little bit. I think in some areas that's gotten a little bit clouded in terms of they've, they've maybe been asking police officers to, you know, you get comfortable with them being there and that's a good thing, but you also get comfortable in some cases maybe with saying, hey, can you can you help me with this situation? Well, really, that's something that, that the administration should be dealing with. So at a meeting on Tuesday, when uh, the board uh, approved the amendment to the interlocal agreement with Brazos County and the Brazos County Sheriff's Office, uh, it, in the master agreement, all those duties are spelled out and have been from the beginning of our relationship with them. And so now Good. what we have to do is put them in the district improvement plan, put them in the code of conduct and all those places that are now mandated by law. All right, uh, 2135 just expands information districts will receive from law enforcement when a student's arrested. You're going to, you already get information, but you're going to get more, and I think you're going to get a more timely manner. Uh, page 37, <clears throat> firearms, uh, a couple of things to be of note. 1143, this one says, um, the statute provides that a school district or may not prohibit a person, including an employee who holds a license to carry a handgun from parking uh, in a school parking lot while transporting a firearm, handgun, or ammunition as long as the car is locked and the item is not in plain view. That's the statute. It goes on to say, beginning with 2019-20, this bill adds that the district may not regulate the manner in which the handgun, firearm, or ammunition is stored in the vehicle. But it can't be visible, it has to be out of view, there's just no require you the district no longer has any authority to tell them how to store that if they happen to bring it and it's in their vehicle. 1791, a little bit different. This was uh, expands the current law that prohibits uh, the school district from posting notice of trespass by a license holder for the concealed or open carry of a handgun in any location where a license holder would not be prohibited from carrying a handgun by law. 
But it goes on to say at the end, unless the license holder is prohibited to carry the handgun in that location by the Texas Penal Code sections 4603 and 035 or other law. Well, obviously, school buildings are prohibited, you know, in that sense. Uh, wording is important here. School premises. Premises is a word that's used and property and things like this. So you have to be yeah, aware of the wording. Yeah. Um, but that's interesting to note. They've got a couple of things to try to, that, that, that's gotten a lot more attention, obviously, um, over the past few years. Um, yeah, just so you know, House Bill 446, if you had an issue with clubs, um, you, you could still have one. Um, the bill removes clubs from the Penal Code 4602, but the bill did not remove clubs from 4603, which prohibits uh, weapons in certain places. Still, and it's still a felony offense to intentionally know or recklessly uh, possess or go with a club on the premises of a school, so they shouldn't have clubs on your school. But it also removes knuckles. So you remember the old brass knuckles things we used to hear about. From the list of prohibited weapons in Texas Penal Code 05, 4605, but it says it leaves the prohibit, prohibition of knuckles up to the local student codes of conduct. So, I guess if a district wanted to ha allow knuckles, they could. That's up to the local district. <laughs> so, that's a little known thing you probably didn't know. Uh, <laughs> Senate Bill 21, you've heard a lot about obviously uh, e-cigarettes and things like this. Well, this has to do with the age, you're, you're aware of this. But it must be over 21. Uh, it's illegal, unless they're in the military. Um, student discipline uh, just has to do with how you report out of school suspensions and more specifically, specifically in House Bill 65. I think it's more about the guidelines you have in your district and are you consistent with those guidelines. Those have to be reported to the commissioner every year, which you do that already. Uh, 692, suspension of homeless. There's a couple of bills dealing with homeless students. One says you may not place in out-of-school suspension, a student who is homeless as defined by the federal law, unless the student engages in conduct, which in this case fall into the penal code system uh, uh, in terms of uh, those types of things like violent assault, sexual assault, aggravated assault, et cetera. Also, uh, dealing with homeless or foster care in this case, House Bill uh, 811, it adds that a student's status as homeless to the list of mitigating factors that must be considered as a factor in any decision concerning suspension. Removal to DAEP or expulsion. Uh, do y'all have a JJAEP? It's operated in Bryan. Obviously. Okay, y'all do have one, okay. Because most, a lot of districts don't because they're not large enough in that, in that county. Regardless of whether the decision is characterized though as mandatory or discretionary. So those are mitigating factors you have to consider. Even if it's mandatory that you do something, it has to be considered if this, if this individual is homeless, if their status is, is classified as homeless. That's a little bit of a change. Just for the edification of the group, we already have some things that must be considered already uh, right. in law. Um, students' intent, discipline history, um, disability status, those types of things already have to be considered, and these just add those to the homeless status and um, foster care. Okay, uh, getting ready, getting close to wrapping her up here. Here we go, uh, 3630, this is an interesting one because of the language, I guess, as much as anything, but may not use aversive technique to reduce the likelihood of a behavior recurring by intentionally inflicting on the student significant physical or emotional discomfort or pain. Chuck, I apologize if I did that to you <laughs> years ago. The term includes a technique or, <laughs> or, or intervention that is designed or likely to cause physical pain, other than corporal punishment, which of course is still allowed by law here. Well, they, they provide 13 examples. I'm not gonna give you all those, but I did look it up and there are 13 examples. Uh, I'll give you a few of those if you'd like to hear what they are. Electric shock, uh, release of uh, noxious spray in a student's face, or if you impair their breathing uh, or chemical restraint. I just wrote a few down, there's 13, so I'm not sure what was going on when they did those things, but. Not here. They're, they are no longer, those are our aversive techniques and that shouldn't be done. So, um, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, you had to have a law for that, yeah, right. Senate Bill 1306, this has to, uh, campus coordinator, you're doing this, just identify who that person is on your campus and you have to have that posted on your, on your website. 
personnel, uh, real quickly, um, 1451 can be a uh, teacher may not be assigned an area of deficiency in an appraisal solely on the basis of disciplinary referrals. It says the key word there is solely uh, made by the teacher. But a teacher, of course, may, however, be assigned an area of deficiency based on documented evidence uh, of the deficiency in the classroom management that you get through observation or, or some sort of substantiated report. Senate Bill 2073 just says it's a reduction in the required days of service. So uh, minimum service typically has been, if you're anticipating less than 180 days of instruction for students, you could, if you wanted to, reduce proportionally the, the, those same days for those that are, especially your teachers, service for an educator for below 187 days. You have 187-day contracts with your, your teachers in particular. Uh, so let's say you had 177 days of instruction. Well, they're saying, well, yeah, you can go ahead and make that change if you want to require they only come the, the same days as the kids. But what it goes on to say is that the bill clarifies that such a reduction in days of service does not reduce an educator's salary. So it's the same salary. They're still on a 187 uh, contract. And nothing on this last page except that, yes, the bill did increase the rate of uh, contributions by TRS, uh, by members, school districts, and state. And, yes, they did make their one-time supplemental payment to retirees. Uh, that's been done already, actually. So that officially ends your training. And we did finish before 1.15 anyway. <laughs> so. and, and barring any questions. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> Uh, I did, I hate to, I had to, but you know, uh, some of that you've heard. And uh, again, you can go online, as you saw earlier, if you want to see those bills. If there's a, something really piqued your interest, go look it up and, 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 and certainly read that bill. But lots to cover. You can see this was a really heavy duty uh, update, it really was. And um, so I appreciate your patience and uh, your interest and, and what you did. And you can check that box off. You won't have to do that for two years. So, so that's probably a good thing. I just I think it was very, very helpful. And well, I hope so. Too. Yeah. And of course, the other comment is they'll all be back at it 18 months from Oh, exactly. Last, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Starting in January. Well, it's yeah. probably already started. It's we know year. it has. But officially, I mean, you can pretty much scan on January. It starts in earnest. I mean, you know, it, we're just still trying to figure out what's happened out this last session to some, in large part. And they're already getting ready for the next one. So. Thank you all. Yeah. yeah, any other yeah. questions? This is a great, this is great training. Well, Thank you. It's, it's interesting. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs>